All right, I see a few people are still joining us, but we'd love to get started. Um, just wanted to note that we are recording this webinar and we'll make it available online as soon as possible if you know others who can attend tonight. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Joan Pickett to open our event. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joan Pickett. I'm the chair of the Charles River Conservancy Board. We are pleased that over 100 persons registered for this virtual event, and I'd like to welcome you all. We are going to start this evening with a video that provides an overview of the Charles River Conservancy's floating wetland project. It is a pilot and it explores a unique approach to potentially reducing harmful cyanobacteria in the Charles. After the video, there's going to be a presentation and more information about the wetland, followed by a question and answer period. In the video, you will meet two key individuals most involved in the project, Laura Janiski and Max Rome, and I'd like to introduce them now. Laura is CRC's executive director who joined in 2018. She brings over 10 years of experience in development and activation of urban open space and has managed several major capital improvement projects and installations in Boston's parks. Max Rome is a PhD candidate at Northeastern University, leading the research team, collecting data on the floating wetland project. Max has partnered with the CRC for several years now, and we greatly value the strong relationship that has developed between the CRC and Northeastern University. I hope you enjoy the video. The Charles River has come such a long way in a few short decades um, from being that dirty water that we all know to a really um, one of the cleanest urban rivers in the country. The Charles River Conservancy has been around for 20 years and we work to protect the parks along the Charles River from Watertown to Boston. We do advocacy work, programming, and stewardship and we work to engage everybody in that mission. We have a vision of having a swim park in the Charles River where people could come and, and cool off in the middle of the city. Um, but to do that, we need to really think about water quality. We have this growing issue of algae blooms or cyanobacteria. And so we are looking for ways that we can control the algae and cyanobacteria around a future swim park. Uh, we see the floating wetland as an, as an ecological approach to dealing with that problem. What we're hoping is that the roots that come out of this floating wetland will shield the zooplankton from predation, basically give them a place to hide and a place to avoid the hungry, hungry fish that are, that are ready to scoop up all the zooplankton. The idea is that if we have more places for these tiny creatures to live, then they could eat more of the algae that we see in the river. The dream is really to imagine a Charles River that is safe for swimming and a Charles River that is just kind of vibrantly healthy and alive and filled with all of the amazing creatures that you know you can see in, in you know, wetlands and healthy rivers as you travel around New England. Oops. When it arrived on site, it arrived in 24 different pieces that were unloaded from a moving truck um, and then put together in rows that could be planted and then carried into the Charles River in sections where it was then um, attached all together into the 700 square foot floating wetland that's in the Charles now. There are actually 3,000 separate plants on the wetland. In the end, we ended up with 19 different species of native New England wetland plants. The criteria that we used for the plants was, you know, they had to be native. The Charles River is a little bit brackish, so they need to have a little bit of salt tolerance. We looked for a diversity of plants, so a mix of you know, sedges and bulrushes, but also plants that are going to have interesting foliage, like pickerel weed, plants that are going to have flowers like irises or um, cardinal flower. And we finally kind of put those together in a planting plan that hopefully is going to be really interesting you know, over the course of the season and also as it grows into its like second and third year. 
We assembled the floating wetlands. That island was then towed down river by a small boat um, underneath the BU Bridge and Nassau Bridge and Longfellow Bridge to its final anchor location, which is along Cambridge Parkway, near where the Broad Canal meets the Charles River. We were lucky to be a recipient of the first round of Sasaki Foundation Design Awards um, and got to work with several of the urban planners, architects, and landscape architects that built the Chicago River Walk, which features floating islands. We did kind of a year-long residency at Sasaki, and that gave us a chance to really imagine the project in a much more expansive way to kind of understand the project, not just as a science project, but also as, you know, a design project as kind of like an art, art installation in some ways, but also as a really great platform for doing um, public education and for engaging people who are walking along the river and kind of finding a way to, you know, stop them in their tracks a little bit and, and uh, give them an opportunity to learn more about water pollution and the role that ecology has in mitigating uh, the effects of water pollution. One of the really fun parts of this project is getting to just look through the microscope every day and see the critters that are coming around in the water and just and how they do their thing. We're asking a really specific question. Can this weapon have a measurable impact on the size the species composition and the abundance of Because of the coronavirus, we had to really make some changes to how slide called the Sedgwick Raptor Mountain Chamber. We're hoping that we can collect enough data and do good enough research to you know, add floating wetlands as another arrow in the quiver or another tool in the toolbox for folks who are working to uh, improve water quality in Massachusetts. The coronavirus pandemic has reminded us how important it is to continue caring for the Charles River. <laughs> Parks are a respite from working from home. Their primary gym, their place to gather the people get out on the water and get away from it all. Well, that was a terrific overview. And some of you may have had a little difficulty with the audio. Um, we're gonna make sure that you all get a link to the video so that if you missed anything, you can re-hear it um, and take another look at it because it really does have a lot of great information. And as you can tell, there's a lot of work, there was a lot of commitment and persistence over several years to get this project from a concept to a reality. And Laura, Max, and Vanessa, who you're gonna meet shortly, were the ones that really made this happen. And I'd like to thank them for a job well done. We thank you too, as we would not have been able to bring this idea to life without your financial support. And we hope you will continue to support our work, the other projects in development, and our existing programming. If you'd like to donate online or learn more about supporting the CRC, please visit the website on your screen. I'd like to now introduce Vanessa Nason, who's the Associate Director in the CRC joining in 2016. She works across operations and programs and was instrumental in shepherding the floating wetland pilot project forward and the Charles River Conservancy's River Swimming Initiative. Vanessa will now be moderating the rest of this evening's program. Thank you, Joan. Um, 
And I really want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I know that a lot of us spend much of our day <laughs> these days on video. And so your enthusiasm for this project by joining us tonight really means a lot to us. Um, I think the video did a really great job of capturing many of the highlights of the project. Um, but I think, you know, it can't, it can't cover everything. And so we really wanted to give Laura and Max, who were so key in so many aspects of this project, an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper. Um, I know there's a lot of questions and um, we got some great ones from your registration um, reports. Um, but I would also encourage you to ask questions throughout. We'll leave some time at the end to address those. Um, and so if you kind of use the, the Q&A function on your Zoom menu bar, um, we'll be monitoring those and we'll try to get to as many as we can before the end of the event. Laura, I'd love to start with you. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting how this ERC came to be in this project and, um, and partner with Northeastern. So I'd love for you to give us just a little bit of insight about how this all came about. Sure. Thanks, Vanessa. And again, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, this project is really, you know, at the core of what the CRC does. You know, you can see here, we see ourselves at the center of the parks, the park users, and the river. And we really want that river to be fully utilized in every way that it can be. And that includes swimming. Um, so we actually got into this project um, as, a, as a way, as part of our, our swimming initiative. Um, we've been working with Max for three or four years now, um, starting with doing some water quality sampling over at North Point Park um, to really understand the local um, dynamics of, of the water there to see how close we are to um, having a, a swimmable river, you know, the majority of the time. And the answer is it's very close, um, but we are seeing um, algae blooms and cyanobacteria um, as the biggest barrier to swimming moving forward. Um, so in, in that continuation of partnership with Max and Northeastern, we decided to pilot this floating wetland project. Um, I'll let him get into more of the details of the, the science and the research, but really we're trying to see, is there a, a way in the future where we could use these types of artificial wetlands to help restore the river and help, you know, in a lot of ways, protect a swimming area. Um, so for us, it really is about, let's, let's take full advantage of the river that we have in the middle of our city. Awesome. Well, I think the idea of a floating wetland is a little bit novel and new to some folks. It was great to see it in the video and get a little bit of a sense of the, what it actually is. Um, but I think it'd be great to talk about that a little bit more um, and how long it takes to launch a project like this. Sure. Um, the floating wetland that's in the river right now is 700 square feet, but it's, it's basically a puzzle. It's made up of 24 individual pieces or modules. Um, each of those pieces you can kind of see has a, a buoyant core in the middle made out of a, a recycled plastic that is then wrapped in a coconut fiber. Um, and all of those are held together by a mesh and a steel frame. Um, the, the way it's built allows us to kind of tuck in plants. You could, you could see that a little bit in the video, people tucking the plants in between the, the kind of columns of, those, of that buoyant um, wrapped core to get the roots of the plant right down to the water. So as soon as we put the wetland in the water, um, it was, the plants were getting nutrients and water and everything that they needed. Um, um, the, the island is also anchored in place. So once we towed it from Magazine Beach where it was built, um, we brought it to an anchor point um, up by, um, between the Longfellow Bridge um, and the Craigie Bridge or the Museum of Science. It's, it's very close to um, the Broad Canal, um, which is a great place to rent a kayak and paddle out to it and get really up close. Um, and, and there you can see, we mentioned also in the video, that there are, are 19 different types of plants on the wetland. This was done um, in large part because we knew that not all of the wetland plants were gonna be happy in this pretty unique growing condition. Um, so part of the, the research is really what plants, you know, should we replant with? What plants could we use in this type of installation? Um, uh, and you also asked a bit about like how long this a project like this takes. Um, it's certainly a pilot and, and part of that is, is because it's so new. We've been working on this now for over two years, starting from doing some design work with um, at the Sasaki Foundation from an award that we received um, through to installation was two years. A lot of that is because this, these types of installations are, are hard to permit. You know, it's not something that's typical. You're not installing a dock um, or a pier or something like that. And so we really had to work with a lot of our um, partners at the 
state and um, local level to figure out how we could permit this wetland. Um, a lot of that was about the anchor that we dropped in, um, kind of like, a, you can think of it kind of like a mooring. Um, but, but again, kind of speaks to the complication of these resiliency projects, right? I think that's something that um, in a broader context is really interesting about this project is, is the permitting path that we got, um, that we worked through to, to install the floating wetland and something that I think will be really useful um, for other organizations, other groups looking to do something similar moving forward. Cool, well, some of that um, complexity of, of navigating the permitting path and all that kind of stuff really brings up the need to sort of bring partners and stakeholders with us on projects like this. Obviously, the Northeastern Partnership was so crucial, um, but I wondered if you could highlight a few others that were important to the success of this project. Absolutely. Um, another you know, really key member of the project team is FOTH, which is a mar marine engineering firm. Um, and we work with their New England team, um, and they have been working on this project pro bono. Starting with our engagement with them on the swim park project, um, you know, they really realized how unique and interesting this was and wanted to continue to offer their services. Um, so we, you know, we really could not do um, this type of project without them. And I think also goes to show how nonprofits like the CRC can really leverage those resources and how important that is. Um, all of the work that the CRC does is also in partnership with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR. So from the very beginning, really at that, the beginning mark two years ago, talked with them about where it would go, how we would install this wetland, um, and really work through the details with DCR, um, as well as the other permitting agencies I met. Um, for this project, we worked through um, not only the, the local Cambridge Conservation Commission, um, the State Department of Environmental Protection Waterways Program, which is called Chapter 91. Um, we also had to file some paperwork with, uh, with the federal agency, the Army Corps of Engineers. And really, individuals in those different agencies were so helpful. They all really saw the validity of this project, they were really excited about it, um, and helped us navigate that process and work through it. Um, and then there's also a lot of engagement partners um, that we're continuing to work with which is a, a really exciting part of this project. Um, you know, it's not only about, it's certainly about the research and we're really excited to see um, what Max will learn over the next few years. Um, but we also really see this wetland as an incredible opportunity to engage people in a conversation about the river. Um, there is a lot of still kind of mixed perception about the health of the river and how, and how clean it is um, and, uh, and really just, you know, the ecology of the river. So we're gonna use this physical installation as a starting point for these conversations. Um, some of the things that we're working on now, um, working with um, the city of Cambridge and their community development department um, as part of the, and, and the Glocal Challenge, if, if folks aren't familiar with the Glocal Challenge, um, it is a high school competition based around a theme, and this year was water, and we are fortunate to be working with some of the, the winners, um, a team of four high school students who are developing a video game about the floating wetland that's going to be available to elementary school aged um, students. Um, we are also working with um, science coordinators at the City of Cambridge to think about how we can create online content and physical content to help, especially in this year when being educated and trying to educate is so challenging. So we're, we're fortunate to be working with um, those folks as well as MIT Sea Grant, who's really helping us develop, you know, something like a grow your own wetland at home or grow your own algae at home kit that we could work to distribute um, and help people learn about what we're trying to do. We're also doing, we have some on-site signage that will be um, posted very soon. We specifically engaged an illustrator who could, um, you can see here, our, um, one of her illustrations to really depict what we're trying to do, the different components of this specific wetland, this specific ecology. Um, and then, of, of course, um, we had hoped to have in-person events working with different camps on site. Um, we developed a tag game about cyanobacteria and fish in the food chain. Um, and we hope to do those again, or we hope to, to do those in the future. Um, but for now, we're working with some socially distant um, activities like kayak tours where you can stay kind of far away from each other or enough away from each other and still get out and see the wetland. Yeah, the engagement aspects have definitely been a lot of fun. And I will say that the uh, adults who you can see playing that tag game on the slide um, enjoyed it, I think, as much as uh, some kid groups who played with as well. Um, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about the science with Max. Um, 
turn to you for some of the ecological aspects of the project. Um, as you know, and I know many in our, of our, in our audience are aware, um, the Charles has come a long way in the last couple of decades because of a lot of work from government agencies and advocates. But I find that people are still a little bit uncertain about how to classify the Charles. Um, you know, we have that notorious song that dubbed it that dirty water. And tonight we're talking about the a very current challenge of cyanobacteria blooms. But the APA also grades it annually. And in recent years, it's received as high as an A minus. So as someone who's, you know, been down there with the water every day, looking at this issue closely, what do you think that people should really know and understand about how our river's doing? Yeah, uh, that is, I mean, I think that's a great place for me to kind of start talking about this project or thinking about this project. Um, and anybody's got any, any comments, questions, confusions, just type them in the chat. I've got it open. So if, if uh, there's more to say or less to say about anything, let, let us know. But um, I think a lot of people have seen this kind of data before. Uh, and th so this is the EPA's bacterial water quality report card. So this is kind of a, a measurement of like how much fecal contamination is coming into the Charles River. And for, um, you know, the last 20, the last 30 years, this has been the biggest part of the conversation about uh, how clean is the Charles River. And, you know, kind of as the incredible investment has been made in the river and there's been closure of these kind of combined sewer overflow uh, locations, we've seen, you know, really rapid and amazing improvement in bacterial water quality. Um, and that improvement, I think you could kind of say, has kind of steadied out over the last, uh, you know, over the last 15 years. Um, but one of the, I think one of the like interesting things from this data that, that we can kind of take a look at in the next slide is just how clean certain locations are on the Charles River. So if we kind of pick, pick this bacterial water quality data apart a little bit and we look at the, uh, the summers compared to the winters, we can see that the summers are actually very, very clean, especially at these downstream locations. So spots like the, uh, the New Charles River Dam or near the Longfellow Bridge, you know, these, these locations in terms of bacterial water quality are kind of comparable to, you know, Walden Pond or places that people are really comfortable swimming. Um, but that's just one piece of the puzzle. And the other piece of the puzzle is this, uh, story about cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, which we are kind of thinking of as, you know, in a way it's kind of like a next generation problem. It's a problem that we can start tackling now only because of the incredible progress that's been made on, um, you know, fecal contamination and sewage that's getting into the river. So I think, you know, what, what I'd, I'd like to say to kind of put this project in its proper context is that there's an incredible amount of work being done right now to control these algal blooms. And, um, you know, for folks who are kind of interested in the, you know, public policy piece of this, a lot of that work is, is organized around this regulation that was written in 2007 that um, sets how much nutrient pollution can enter the Charles River. And what that regulation does is it motivates uh, communities and these sub watersheds to kind of come up with plans to make sure that phosphorus and nitrogen are kind of getting intercepted or getting dealt with on city streets before they enter the river. So that, you know, it's, to me, that's kind of the, the big context for this floating wetland project. And what this project is all about is saying, okay, you know, we know that these nutrient reductions are kind of happening upstream, but is there something that we can do in the river to kind of complement those efforts and to start to recreate a water body that's more resilient to, to nutrient stress. So what is the floating wetland gonna do in that context then? So I think the, um, the, the simp, well, yeah, maybe on like three different levels. I think that, yeah, this is, so the simplest way to think about the floating wetland for me is to just think about, you know, wetlands are a really key piece of any healthy water body. You know, any lake or pond that you love 
um, that's clear and good to swim in, you know, there are wetlands that are associated with it. And in the Charles River, you know, when we dammed the river, when we filled the banks of the river, we got rid of all the places that wetlands can go. Um, and so the floating wetland is kind of a, a way to add those wetlands back into the river. And one of the things that it does, which is something that all wetlands do, is it is able to absorb some of the phosphorus and some of the nitrogen that is in the river that fuels these algal blooms and kind of cycle those nutrients in a way that's, uh, that's beneficial and kind of you know, gives those nutrients a different place to go instead of going right into algae. But an, the, the other piece that's a little bit kind of more out there to talk about, which is the piece that um, I'm really interested in studying is this piece about what does the floating wetland do to the ecology of the river? And I think the easiest way to understand that is to um, kind of collectively try and wrap our heads around these words, uh, oligotrophic and eutrophic. And those are words that are used to describe two different ways that a pond or a water body can be. One is um, a state that's very clear that's dominated by, um, you know, that's characterized by like a really efficient food chain where energy can flow from algae and nutrients all the way up into predatory fish very easily. And then the second eutrophic is a word that kind of describes a, you know, a well-fed or a kind of overfed water body where we're seeing these really intense cycles of algal blooms and algal die-offs and those have effects throughout the, throughout the water body. Um, so what this, you know, so the Charles River is, is absolutely in the eutrophic category. And what this project is all about is about seeing whether or not we can create a very small bubble where the food chain starts to look a little bit more like the healthy food chain um, than the current food chain. So I know you and your research team were out there the morning after the wetland was installed and have been out there almost daily since. Um, what are they looking for? What do you hope to see um, over the course of the project or even just in the past couple months? Yeah, so I, th I think the audio of the on that video might have glitched out a little bit when <laughs> when I was <laughs> describing that. But um, yeah, we go out every every six days a week during the summer and we're measuring two things. We're measuring um, the cyanobacteria, figuring out kind of how much of this algae is in the water. And then we're measuring the zooplankton. So the zooplankton are kind of all the different tiny organisms, you know, micro crustaceans or rotifers, cladocerans um, that live in the Charles River. And these are the species that they're kind of super critical. They're the link between algae and, you know, the fish and the kind of the rest of the food chain. So our, you know, a good, a good research project has a very specific question a very specific hypothesis and what we're investigating is uh is this wetland going to have a, an effect on the zooplankton population and what, what we're hoping to see is we're hoping to see larger zooplankton and we're hoping to see kind of a, a shift in the species density from um kind of a, a dominance of smaller species like rotifers and copepods to some of the larger uh, cladocerin, cladocerin species. So, you know, that's what we're, yeah, the, the, the daily work of that is literally uh, collecting zooplankton in a net and then sticking them under a microscope and counting um, thousands and thousands of these little guys measuring their bodies. That's a copepod with eggs. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> so, cool. yeah. Uh, these guys are really interesting. So these are, you know, these are some of the crustaceans that live, some of the micro crustaceans that live in the Charles River. And, you know, one thing that's really cool about them is they have a, uh, a larval stage that's called a, a nauplius. And um, the larval stage, yeah, in, in the picture before this, we can, we can take a look at those, but the lar these are the larval stage, these kind of funny little guys with, with six legs and these kind of feathery appendages. Um, and just recently I've been seeing these really, really triangular nauplius that I haven't seen at all all summer long. I was trying to figure out what they are, and they are, um, I think they're actually barnacle larvae. So there's all sorts of really kind of fun surprises when you are taking such an intimate look at what's going on in the water. Definitely. 
Well, I know, I think people probably uh, have already gotten a pretty good sense of how enthusiastic and energetic you are for this project, but as someone who grew up in Cambridge and, you know, has a lifelong connection to the Charles, I was wondering if you could just personally tell us what, what this project and what the river means to you. Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, yeah, so I grew up in Cambridge and I, you know, spent my whole life very near the Charles River and, uh, you know, my parents used to take me to kind of every puddle and pond that they could possibly drag me out to. And I, you know, I love fishing and I love spending time just, you know, catching things in nets. But we really never spent very much time on the Charles River. And, uh, you know, now I, I live in Alston and it's really exciting to see how many people are, you know, taking their kids fishing on the docks out there and kind of how much life I really believe has returned to the Charles even just in the last 20 years. So for me, this project is just such a, such a dream project to imagine taking this river, you know, the next step to a place where there's real, you know, functional wetlands and kind of the way that we can really create a much more um, thriving ecology along, along the river, you know, thriving just for the thrill of every human who gets to, experience that um but also you know as a as an environmental engineer you know what's so exciting is to to have an opportunity to kind of make that link between ecological health and water quality which is is not a link that we know how to make very well with our with our science so this is a really special project to me and well, as you talked a little bit about sort of the ultimate vision for this project, I think it's a great opportunity to segue back to Laura. Um, I don't think the wetland was installed a day before we were getting uh, multiple questions about what's next. Um, so I know some in the audience have, have asked the same thing. So I was wondering if you could kind of share what the vision and next steps might be for this project. Sure, happy to. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're, we're you know, interested in learning what Max's data tells us, right? We're going to learn right along with him and, and hopefully have more of these programs so that, you know, you all who are interested can, can learn with us too and, and keep everybody up to date. Um, but really thinking about, you know, how can we, in a very urban river, restore some of these wetlands? I think this, you know, it could definitely look like, you know, these types of images you're seeing where you have this aquatic park, right? You have along the seawall, you have wetlands lining it. So you're bringing back the river bank. Um, you know, maybe you're kayaking between a couple of islands. Maybe one of the islands has a platform that you could get off or an outdoor classroom, which I think we're realizing how important they are. So really thinking about um, how we can use these to make the river um, a place for people um, and for different animals and, and to restore the ecology. Um, and then of course, we're also thinking about swimming in particular. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, this project really started as um, a way of trying to bring a swim park in the Charles to life to make this to make this feasible and real um, and a really tangible step towards that. So we would also love to have, you know, that type of um, aquatic park, you know, have a swimming hole in the middle of it where we, these wetlands are actively working to protect and clean and, and keep that water healthy that you're swimming in um, because we are we are really, really close to, to that reality. Um, um, and to really continue this work, you know, I'll, we, we really do rely on our supporters and our donors. And so, um, you know, if folks are interested in what, you're, in what you're seeing and what you're hearing, again, we really encourage you to check out our website to, to think about making a contribution, to reach out and ask questions. And, um, you know, we really could not continue to do this work without the, the community that is, you know, evident tonight supporting us. Great. Um, well, we've had a lot of questions come in. Um, so, and I think we can we can jump right into that. Um, maybe as you've talked about it expanding, I think one of the questions, be if it is data driven, um, kind of will go to Max of how do you figure out how to right size something like this in terms of the impact it can have on on the river and particularly a, a flowing body body of water. Yeah. So Alexander, you you were asking a, a version of this question. Um, and I'm going to try and answer it in like the, there's kind of a simple answer and a, and a kind of more complicated answer. So, I mean, the first thing to say is that nobody knows how to size floating wetlands, um, period. So, you know, whether you're designing a floating wetland to treat stormwater in a, in a detention pond or whether you're looking at um, 
you know, achieving a certain target in a wastewater lagoon or whether you're using them for, you know, remediating um, a natural water body. It's kind of a really big open question. And that's what this research project is about. And I think there's, there's basically two ways to go at it. The, the most straightforward way is to kind of approach it as a, like a mass balance in terms of nutrient removal. So if you, you know, basically what the 2007 TMDL with this regulation that sets limits for nutrients coming into the Charles River does, is it says for every different sub-watershed, and uh, I know there's some people in the audience who can explain this much better than me, um, but what it says is for every, every single sub-watershed, hey, here's how much phosphorus we think you're dumping into the river now, and here's how much phosphorus we are saying you are allowed to dump into the river. So you need to, you know, for instance, uh, the Fens, the, you know, the Muddy River, you need to reduce your annual phosphorus contribution to the river by 500 kilograms per year. So the easiest way to size the floating wetland would be to figure out how much floating wetland you need to remove those 500 kilograms per year. Um, and we did, uh, we've done a couple kind of back of the envelope calculations to try and figure out, you know, based on current research, what, what might that answer be. Um, but the kind of more complicated answer is that that TMDL is based on what's called a, a hydrodynamic water quality model, which just means it's a, it's a water quality model that considers the fact that water is, is flowing through the river. And that water quality model includes some terms for algal growth and some terms for predation. So what we would hope to do would be to take the data that we're collecting about zooplankton and use that to um, fine tune those predation terms and plug that into this hydrodynamic model and kind of come at it from both angles, you know, both uh, what's, you know, how much is needed to achieve the nutrient targets. And if we add this kind of ecological or food chain component, how does that change the picture? Um, please type away if that made sense or did not make sense. I might uh, switch it up just a little bit and maybe have Laura talk about um, maintenance and sort of how the the wetland might change over the seasons and how long we expect it to last durability and stuff. There were a lot of questions about, you know, how do you keep this in the water during the winter and, you know, how long it would it last if you just kept it there? Sure. So uh, to take the last part of that question first, these these wetlands are made to last, you know, over um, over 10 years. Um, and so for our pilot project, the scope of that um, is about two to three years. So um, it will certainly um, stand the test of, of, of this project. Um, we are going to be moving this wetland from its current location by the Broad Canal um, over by the MIT Sailing Pavilion. Um, there being a really great another partner who's letting us um, park the wetland, if you will, by their sailing pavilion because they have bubblers, which keeps the water sheet from freezing in the winter. Um, and so we, we want to do that as a, as a precaution to make sure that the ice wouldn't damage the frame or any of the structure. Of the wetland. Um, but we do want to keep it in the water so that as soon as um, the plants have the ability, they can grow and we hopefully see a lot more growth in the next year um, on the wetland. Um, I think the other, you know, um, the piece of maintenance, we have a contractor who um, is basically on speed dial, if you will. <laughs> you know, the, the CRC um, doesn't own a boat. So if something happens, you know, we can kayak out to it. But um, we have a marine contra contractor named Houghton Marine who, if, you know, something were to happen um, and we need someone to react really quickly, they, they could be there and they have whatever equipment they need to, to um, fix the wetland and, and they inspect it every year and they were the ones that actually installed it. So, um, yeah, other than that, we might have to, you know, replace a few pieces here and there. We plan to do some replanting of the, the species that didn't do as well or some that maybe don't make it through the winter. So we're certainly planning on that, but um, otherwise it should be a fairly low maintenance pilot project. Yeah, touching upon the aspect of plants and how they'll winter over or if we need to reseed or replant or anything like that. Um, Max, maybe you could step in and just add a little bit more about what you're seeing about how well the plants are doing on the island right now and what you would kind of anticipate in the coming year. Yeah, so, well, it's been so interesting kind of seeing what's, what's doing well and what's, and what's not doing quite as well. 
Um, one of the things that I just say is, you know, kind of what's cool about this project is it's, it's like a, a novel ecosystem. You know, these are all native New England plants, but there's really, there's really nowhere in New England that they're going to grow exactly like they're growing on the floating wetland. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed just kind of going out there this summer is that um, it's a really, really windy environment and it's an incredibly blasted sunny environment. So it's, it's, um, you know, even more unique than maybe I, I was thinking about. Um, but the, yeah, just to kind of give some of the greatest hits, the uh, one of the plants that we were confident was going to do well is a is a plant called marshmallow, which is a, a like a native hibiscus, and that's doing really really well. Um, so are all of the soft stem bulrushes and the uh, and the sedges, um, and then you know we tried to pick a bunch of plants that would be really exciting for you know for pollinators and exciting have exciting flowers for for folks to look at and what what was interesting this year was so plants like like uh bone set joe pie weed labelia that cardinal flower um what was interesting is all of those plants flowered and went to seed this year but they didn't necessarily they looked kind of they looked like they got hit pretty hard by the sun so you know we did plant like june 23rd so we're hoping that as they're able to kind of wake up earlier in the season and those seeds kind of germinate where they want to be next year i'm, I'm hoping that um there will be like a little bit more self-shading and and uh, stuff will do will do well next next season yeah and i'll just jump in um for a plug for our websites we do have a, a nice document kind of picture some good info on the 19 species that are on the wetland and i think max even has the planting plan for for how we uh how we put them all in on his website as well. Um, I'll, I'll jump in with one more plant related question and then I promise I'll switch, switch topics here. Um, but you know, for our work, invasive species along the, the river just definitely becomes um, a big topic. And so people are wondering if you've noticed anything taking hold that maybe you hadn't intended would be there. Yeah, I, we've really been on the lookout, like especially for like purple loosestrife, which gets all over the place and um, I haven't seen that yet. There's kind of a couple uh, unidentifiable, at least to me, uh, you know, grasses that have found their way onto the wetland and are kind of starting to sprout. And um, but nothing, nothing invasive that that we've identified yet. But it is, I mean, it's really interesting to see kind of what's colonizing the wetland. One of the really interesting things that is colonizing the wetland is spiders. There's like a, three or four different species of spiders that have found their way out there and um, are, are doing great. Um, you know, I think people acknowledge that it's, it's still early in the, in the project here to have results. Um, but I think people are wondering, like, do you, have you seen a difference in water quality? Have you seen a difference in, in sort of like the, the life in the water or the life, you know, on the wetland itself, other than maybe spiders? <laughs> Yeah, so the, and there were a couple questions in the, in the chat about this as well, of like, you know, how are you going to measure a difference in water quality? The only, the only parameter that we really think will be different will be the size of the zooplankton and, and, you know, which ones are there. And um, right now it's a little bit too early to say. In a lot of ways, this was kind of a perfect season because it's a season in which the roots haven't really established themselves. So as the roots grow, we'll hope to see that kind of selection effect happen more and we'll be, be able to compare it to this year. But um, one of the things that was very dramatic, so the first thing that kind of jumps out of the data is that there's a really big effect on the zooplankton population of how much cyanobacteria is in the water. So as the bloom happens, it really chokes down the larger zooplankton and kind of restarts this cycle where the zooplankton kind of have to reseed themselves from the smaller rotifers up to the um, up, up to the copepods. So you know that's a kind of an effect an effect that we're going to have to account for very carefully when we're looking for the difference between the the wetland and the control location. 
And I think maybe this got answered offline or in chat, um, but someone had asked about, you know, why the why the wetland isn't located where we're proposing the swim park. And well, Laura wanted to let everyone know about, you know, in projects, sometimes surprises come up. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, we had intended to put the floating wetland up in North Point Park. Um, um, however, if anybody's been there recently, you'll probably see a lot of cranes and construction equipment. Um, the MBTA is taking advantage of the green line closure between Leachmere and North Station to rehab the Leachmere Viaduct um, from the water and from barges. So we would have been quite squeezed in our original location. So we found um, a location nearby that would have you know, similar water conditions um, and, and moved. And, and we talked a lot with the, the boaters in that area, the, the duck boat the Charles River Yacht Club has been a really great partner, um, helping us get out there with a bigger boat when we need to, other than a kayak, um, uh, and some of the other you know boats that use that area. So that's why we ended up by the Broad Canal. Um, maybe on that sort of general topic, um, you know, I think a lot of people who were in watching tonight were interested in doing this in their communities. And so I wonder if you have any lessons learned or sort of uh, words of wisdom for people wanting to pursue something like this. Sure. I, you know, I think um, I was really flattered when one of our, again, partners at one of the permitting agencies told me that I should win an award for persistence. Because um, I think it really does just take that, um, you know, following through and, and really pushing and following up and, and persisting through a lot of um, what can be really challenging, um, you know, paperwork, permitting processes and keep asking questions. Um, we are hoping and, and planning on uh, disseminating the information um, and, and kind of the permitting path that we took to get this pilot in, the, the strategy, the different, you know, specific permits that um, we obtained to help make that easier for another group in the future. Um, but overall, I really think that process just takes a lot of attention to detail, a lot of persistence, and a lot of patience. Interesting. Um, someone noted that they saw a, a fence around the floating wetlands. And so I think maybe, Max, you mentioned the reason why, but um, they were concerned it might keep away the ducks. Oh, well, the ducks are there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, yeah, it's that concept is like you don't want geese being like this is our new place to poop and hang out on the river. But um <laughs> that ducks are a little bit more nimble and there was um a mother duck who probably had an interesting story who had just one duckling who was hanging out on the wetland um for a couple weeks. But she, I think we bothered her every time we come out um so I think she found a, a more relaxing place to, to be. But in the future, you know, when this, if this was more part of the river and we weren't sampling every square foot of it all the time, it's a, it's a nice place for, for ducks to hang out. I caught a heron there the other day. He was pretty happy. Yeah, that's an amazing, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, well, Laura, one thing that, um, that someone brought up. I know you, you talked about a lot of the partnerships that we have formed and has, how important those have been. Um, people are wondering if there are, you know, industries or university partnerships or um, anything like that that, you know, you're looking, looking for and that the project would benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've really seen this, again, this project as a platform, a jumping off point for, for lots of different partnerships. And, we very much value the one that we have with Max and Northeastern, and that is, you know, that takes kind of precedent, making sure that that research is, um, you know, unaffected and that he has everything he needs to do the sampling. Um, but we've also, again, been talking with some folks at MIT Sea Grant and are definitely open to other conversations on how this play into other, um, either, either research um, and certainly education. I mentioned a few um, of the partnerships that we're building in, in Cambridge, but obviously there's a lot of other organizations out there um, that are working with um, youth in particular right now. And I think that that's certainly, um, again, with, with COVID and, and online learning and hybrid learning, you know, we really want to offer, you know, what we could do well as an organization um, and to create content and support these other groups. So definitely, I think if there are folks out there that are interested in some sort of learning partnership, absolutely. Um, and we've been doing things like um, getting volunteers to do not just around the wetland but elsewhere you know trash cleanups around the river i think 
you know, that's certainly an important aspect of just keeping the, the parks in the river that we have clean and our, um, have our volunteer program back up and running um, this fall and this summer. So um, are really looking to work with a lot of corporate groups um, and individuals on helping us keep um, both the water area around the wetlands, you know, we're doing some kayak trash pickups, um, but also the parks themselves, um, helping, helping, you know, pick up trash, helping remove invasive species where we're seeing them there. Um, and, and helping us do some of that really important maintenance work. Great. Um, well, to turn it back to um, a science question again, Max, I know you have, you talked a little bit about, you know, this is that this floating wetland is a little bit novel in your approach of looking at the zooplankton and habitat. Um, I know that nutrient removal or up, uptake is also something that you're, you're looking at closely. Um, so could you maybe talk, talk a little bit more about that so that people have an understanding of how you're measuring that, how you're able to quantify what, what this size wetland can do? Yeah, and I mean, I'll just take a step back and say, for folks who are gardeners, you know, when we're saying nutrients, you can kind of think of fertilizer, and we're mostly talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. And on the Charles, we really care about phosphorus. Um, and, and with you know, phosphorus, basically, the plants need phosphorus to grow. You know, every plant kind of, if you, if you pluck the plant, dehydrated it, um, and, and analyzed it, it's, it would be, you know, somewhere in the range of 1% phosphorus by dry weight. And this is um, something that's actually been studied very well with floating wetlands. People do work, they grow plants on the wetlands. Um, and then they break them down, they try and figure out how much phosphorus they took up. So we don't have to replicate that entire process. What we're going to just do basically is, is be able to know um, how much plant were we able to grow in, in two years and kind of use that number to calculate how much phosphorus was, was removed, um, if, if, that, if that makes sense. So you, you kind of go from plant growth to look at the literature, how much phosphorus per plant are people citing for, you know, soft bull rush um, when you can do the population. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, Flora, this kind of touches upon the idea of expansion. Um, as people are wondering if other communities are trying this, are there other examples in Massachusetts that you know of? Um, yeah. Sure. Some of the examples we looked to were um, the Chicago Riverwalk. Um, also the Baltimore Harbor um, doesn't have them right now, but they used to have them. They're also being used um, in a lot of coastal communities to help um, with storm surge and to break wave action. Another um, uh, unfortunate um, effect of climate change. Um, so more and more folks are looking to use wetlands for a number of different reasons. Um, this is the first in the, in the Charles, particularly the lower basin. Um, but we're, we're talking with a lot of other folks um, in Cambridge, you know, neighboring communities, Arlington and beyond, who are interested in, um, you know, being able to install these in some of their water bodies. Oh, I had yeah. one, other, one other question that I liked, if there's time for it. Um, yeah. Which was, uh, Lizzie Andrews was asking a, a great and unanswerable question. When do you estimate that Charles will regularly be swimmable? Um, and obviously there's not an answer to that question, but I think there's two ways to think about it. And one is in terms of that kind of bacterial look that we had before, you know, we can think, we can see that things were heading in the right direction, but that they're not necessarily really improving anymore right now. And then the second piece is about the cyanobacterial blooms. And right now, I think there might be some loud microphone that's coming in as well. But um, right now, the what's happening with blooms is that they are heading in the wrong direction. So cyanobacteria growth is really, really influenced by climate change. So as the water gets warmer, the blooms are going to last longer. And what that does to precipitation in Boston is it makes more intense rainstorms that last a shorter amount of time and flush flush nutrients more aggressively into the water. So I think the uh, my my takeaway is that 
we're kind of in a little bit of a stalemate right now and it's going to take really being creative and really us collectively being educated about about the problems that are in front of us to to make the progress that we need to make well great on that note i'd love to have laura wrap us up yeah so um again as i mentioned we're hoping to do more of these in the future max is really digging into his research um and and we'll have more to share in the months um and in years ahead um so we hope that you'll keep an eye out we hope that you'll particularly follow us on social media check out our website um, we'll have lots of updates there sign up for our newsletter you can do that on our website um, it's a monthly newsletter if you're not a part of it already we give a lot of updates on what's going on in the charles certainly about this project and other events um, and again if you're in, really interested in in this project and interested in supporting this work we'd also really um, appreciate contributions to our Riverbank Annual Fund. Thanks everybody for coming. It was really exciting to see so many um, familiar and new names um, on the attendees tonight. Thank you.